The Father's Day card that I sent my dad this year had an image of a young man in a suit and tie with his brown hair neatly combed to the side. And below it was a picture of a scruffy man that was balding in an undershirt. And the wording on the front page said, before kids and <laughs> after kids. And the inside said, at least I was worth it. Right, Dad? <laughs> right, Dad? <laughs> Dad, right? Happy Father's Day. I've noticed that over the past decade or so, each year I've become more and more appreciative at Mother's Day and Father's Day of what my parents actually did to contribute to our family. I am one of five kids. Five kids? I cannot fathom having five kids. The comedian Jim Gaffigan says, you ever wonder what it's like having a fourth kid? Imagine you're drowning and someone hands you a baby. <laughs> so what is five kids like? That joke is frightening to me. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> when I was a kid, I hated hearing jokes like that. But now I totally get the need for a safety valve to release the tension of being responsible for the life of another human being who thinks that a diaper change is a punishment. I don't know how my parents had five children and stayed somewhat sane, I guess. Another comedian said having children is like having a bowling alley installed in your brain. <laughs> and yet so many people choose to do this, and plenty of others struggle to do this. Work at it, take shots of hormones, undergo painful procedures, or travel across the world and wait for a long period of time to find the children that they seek to raise. All of us working so hard to have someone roll around in our bed way too early on a Saturday morning, kicking us in the face. <laughs> Jim Gaffigan says, raising kids may be a thankless job with ridiculous hours, but at least the pay sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we do it. I'm so grateful that this is our first, our son will be a year old in about in a month. So we do this, and while I don't love every minute of it, and there are minutes of it I'm sure I will not miss, I am coming to know a love in my life that's different from how I have loved other people. My child requires me to decenter myself in my own life in fundamental, basic ways all day long. Having a child has changed how I think about free time, sleeping time, <laughs> What sitting down to eat a meal means. It's changed how I spend money, how I value money, how I take care of my body, how I tend to my marriage. Having a child has changed how I live. And while I don't always welcome that, I do find ways to adapt to what I'm being called to do by this deep, yearning love. There is a wisdom I think we can glean from this kind of transformative love in our lives, the love that's unyielding, that's inconvenient, that's demanding, a kind of love that compels us to do what we would never choose to do on our own, to give up what we would never choose to give up on our own. A wisdom that we could choose to carry from our personal lives, to apply it more broadly into our communal and social lives with one another. A wisdom and a willingness to integrate other people as they are even when it aggravates us, inconveniences us, and requires us to change ourselves. You don't have to be a parent to know the inconvenience that love can demand of you. Our loved ones, whether they're our mothers, our fathers, our partners, our spouses, sisters and brothers, our lifelong friends, each with their own particular incessant way of just being exactly who they are rather than who we would have them to be, they call us to do what we would never choose to do on our own so that we may stay in loving and dignified relationships with them. There are ways we could consider applying this kind of willingness and wisdom that we've learned over time, perhaps to even our political divides. Yes, I'm going there. <laughs> yes, I found a way, I'm that good. <laughs> right? Right, we can do that, can't we? Right? We, it's worth it, right? Right? I know there's got to be a way. I've been struggling to find it for many months now. 
In April, I attended a conference in New York City called Revolutionary Love, Disruptive Ethics to Dismantle Racism. Hallelujah, they're gonna show me the way, right? <laughs> right? Their main message of the conference was that we must love our opponents. Even if they dehumanize us, other us, criminalize us, injure us, or refuse to see and recognize the dignity of our identities. If we decide that they aren't worth listening to, they're not worth engaging, they're not worth respecting, if we're hating them and we're trying to shut them down or shut them out, then odds are we are doing the very same dehumanizing behavior that we find so objectionable. My first reaction when I heard this from the stage was, yes. <laughs> Huge eye roll. Did I really spend all this money to come here and hear this? Loving our opponents is not going to help poor women receive the reproductive health care that they need access to. It's not going to help stop white people in our state from feeling uh, threatened by the presence of black people and dis dismantle our stand, the ground, stand your ground legislation that was recently passed this year. Sure, I agree intellectually and philosophically that we need to love our opponents, but I can guarantee you there's not the same kind of conference going on across the political chasm, right? How do we love and embrace them? I came to this conference because it was jam-packed with social justice visionaries, and I wanted their vision. I came for strategies, not spiritual direction. And this message would have been completely intolerable to me if it had not come from people of color. For many at the conference, it was still annoying. Attendees and presenters alike both struggled to try to find a way to integrate this message with integrity. When one of the conference organizers, Valerie Cower, she's a sick advocate, uh, activist, she said, this isn't a fluffy, simple kind of love. It's the kind of love that called her into activism after September 11th when the very first hate crime that occurred was a murder of a man who was her uncle. He was a sick. It's the kind of love that her uncle and his murderer, she said, have both been harmed by love and this kind of love, they've been harmed by hatred and they, this kind of love, revolutionary love, can see that. It doesn't hold the murderer outside of love. It says, we have all been wounded by white supremacy in this time. totally get that up here in my mind and it takes me and it might you a long time for it to journey down to here for me to open a door to be willing to allow that vision of love to inhabit my own words and my choices my vision I've been too angry to be open to that kind of love I'm sure many of us wish we could just access some patience to be able to listen so that we could listen in a way that would change people, right? Not actually listen in a way that might change me or change you. I've been too angry to be open to listen to more words from people I disagree with, too injured. It's maddening. I would love to be less reactive. I would love to be the person that I feel being an ordained minister demands me to be, to be able to listen, to be loving. It's so hard. But I know that if I'm leading people from a place of hate, that I am sharing toxicity into the world, and that I won't be able to sustain my own energy or work, and I'm probably going to attract people to work with me that I don't really want to work with, right? Because anger can be energizing, and it has a place in my life, in our lives, but hatred is toxic. I can feel the difference in my being. Anger tells us that what is happening is not right, that some boundaries have been crossed. But hatred, hatred is becoming obsessed with what other people are doing. It's focusing on them exclusively. And we place the cup when we do that of being victims. We pick up the victim cup and we put the poison to our own lips and we drink it hoping the other people will die. Right? That is resentment. We nurture the resentment when we keep focusing on what other people have done. 
and we give up our own serenity, and we give up our freedom in ways that they never even asked us to. We let them occupy our spirits all day long. I know that justice that is rooted in hate is not truly justice, and that while we may win a victory, we're not actually free. Booker T. Washington said, you can't hold a man down without staying down with him. There are so many things I know up here, but actually getting it down into here to open a door. I just sat there on that Friday night thinking, why am I here? I've poisoned myself so many times. I don't want to live like that. And yet since the election, I have not known how to move the lessons that I've learned in my personal life into my public life. In fact, I wanted to offer a sermon about the solace I was finding in giving up hope. <laughs> and I said it to several of you and people just went. And I was like, you haven't read the book yet. I, you know, I can really spell it out in my sermon, but thank God I went to this conference where they shared with me a different vision. They shared that revolutionary love doesn't end. I couldn't hear anymore once they said, love your enemies. I just shut down. But what they were saying is that we have to begin with loving ourselves and loving one another. And when we do that, then we have space to love those who have hurt us. This in my life, I know. This is a path I have walked. My ears perked. Revolutionary love travels in three directions. It travels inward, it travels to others, and it travels beyond those we want to have in our circles. As the conference followed this trajectory with different areas of speakers speaking about that love for ourselves, love for others, love for our enemies, we started to weave a vision for a way forward in love that I am totally, totally energized by. Michael Crumpler was a seminarian who was president, and he spoke, and he is a Unitarian Universalist aspirant to the ministry, and he works at, our, um, at the Office of Intercultural uh, affairs and LGBTQ issues, and he might be working with us as we proceed on our path towards a welcoming congregation. And he was so powerful. He shared that his act of revolutionary love is for him to love himself. As a black man, to love his voice, to love the language he uses, to love his lips, to love his skin, to really love his skin to love his body, to love his thighs, to love the way he walks, the way he thinks, as a gay man, to love the way he loves, to honor the beauty of the way he makes love. He didn't name the political wounds that have been legislated or tweeted or declared in courtrooms. He reclaimed the protagonist role in his own life. He centered his story, he wasn't the victim, he was the subject naming his vulnerable and beautiful reality from the center, not from the margins. And as he reclaimed the beauty of his humanity, we couldn't help but turn ourselves from the sense of despair and dread and fear to hooting and hollering, <laughs> to having a sense of love and vision of companionship. As we witnessed and attested to his beauty and his worth, we could see a way forward together. Before we can see people who have hurt us as more than transgressors, we have to first tell our own stories. We have to humanize ourselves, reclaim it, and honor it in one another. And when we do this, when we share the anger, yes, and we hold our hurts, but under the anger is also the tenderness, the sadness, the yearning to be connected, to be whole. And we do this with one another. We care deeply for ourselves. And we find healing. And then forgiveness and compassion can become a possibility. Have you known this in your life? I hope you have. I have. There's a Buddhist teaching story that helped me get there. Pema Chodron tells this story. Um, there is a man walking in the woods, and he finds himself hurt, and he turns around, and he looks, and there's an arrow in his back. And he looks around the woods, and he sees that there's an archer 
who is hunting across the way and who has shot him. In that moment, he has choices about what is he going to do. He could run away in fear with an arrow in his back, which would probably move the arrow around and make the wound hurt, and it would really hurt, right? He could turn around and be angry with that archer and go chase him and tell him off and beat him up, all the while with an arrow in his back that is continuing to bleed and to worsen. Or he has a choice where he can pause and begin to deal with the arrow in his back to pay attention to and to try to stop the bleeding and to be tender with his own wound. And once he has come to a place of some healing, to then turn to say, what is going on, right? <laughs> to address, and he will have anger, sure, but he won't be openly bleeding. That archer can't do anything for him in that moment that he can't do for himself. He does not need that person to save him. He needs his own attention and care to make choices that move him towards healing. I've turned to that story so many times because it is counterintuitive to me. When I have an arrow in my heart, I want to blame, I want to be angry, I want to protect myself. And sometimes I need to do that, but it's not usually to punish or to make so making someone else hurt is not going to heal me. And it's counterintuitive, but that story, I turned to it for the last 15 years over and over again. Just say, breathe. Breathe and be compassionate with your own pain first, Aaron. That is the most direct path I have ever found to being able to live my values in the world. That then I can come to greet the other with respect and not just shoot more arrows. And it takes time. It takes time for me to put the arrows down. It takes time for me to be willing to put the arrow down and to look at my own heart. It's not an easy path. The conference organizers kept saying, revolutionary love is not this fluffy, simple nicety or platitude. We are not just offering you spiritual direction today, ultimately is what they were saying. We know that defeating our opponents is not going to make us free. It's only walking with love for ourselves, with others and for even our enemies that will give us the kind of peace and joy that really shows our gratitude for the gift of life. And so we spent not one sermon, not one Soul Matters group, not one processing session, not one evening, not one press conference, not one editorial, but we spent three days together hearing each other's stories into our wholeness. Three days hearing about the prolific archers of white supremacy, of misogyny, of transphobia, of heterosexism, of homophobia. As our speakers named the beauty of their identities, we reclaimed ourselves and our spirits were lifted. We gained energy, we gained companions, we found song and laughter again. And by the end, I was so high on love that if you are on the membership council and you came to the meeting the next night, you saw Aaron manic with love. <laughs> I had such a vision for what love looks like, what membership looks like, what relating to one another truly looks like that I think I frightened a few people. <laughs> and I know I frightened the office. And I was told, there are people in here trying to arrange a space. And I was like, so what? Let's be loving <laughs> to finally have that in my heart again after it felt anything but possible this last legislative session in our state. Showing up, showing up in droves only to be silenced and have legislation pushed through at a rapid pace. That doesn't feel revolutionary to me. It's a lot of change, but it doesn't feel revolutionary. Being with people and actually slowing down to love one another. I rolled my eyes, but they were right. I felt, I felt it, and it was revolutionary. I heard a strategy that spoke to me about from a woman who's an organizer, and she is a part of a collective of people of color who organized together to amplify the voices of people on the margin. And they created these opportunities called the People's Supper. And what they do at these, they have two versions, a healing supper and a bridging supper. 
And at the healing supper, they ask questions like, What's, where are you hurt? Where does it hurt right now? And what do you need from the people around you to be the most bold and courageous self that you can be? And at the healing suppers, they ask questions, or the bridging suppers, they bring together people across religion, race, political divides, and they ask each other to share a meal. And as they toast to the people who inspired them to be at this meal, then they follow up with the question, when, how, and from whom did you learn to be a citizen? And they ask them there to share in the meal, and as they go around, they also share, tell us about a time where you were made to feel unwelcome, unsafe, unworthy, threatened. And they invite people to share a time when you were made to feel the opposite of that, to feel fully seen and at ease. And they ask people to reflect on how can we create more of the latter together. Last month, a handful of people from the church joined me at a congregant's house where we shared in one of the healing suppers. And it was a powerful, powerful experience. I organized it because I needed it. I don't know how to be your minister of social justice before I do some healing and tending to the hurt in myself and among us. I don't want us to show up from a place of self-righteousness and anger and hatred that shuts down other people. I want us to actually be the people we say we are, which is to engage in creative interchange, which means we trust in showing up in a way that, if, that we allow other people to transform us in ways that we know we could never be transformed on our own, that pathways to love and to understanding and compassion in life can only come through our openness to one another. We can't do it all on our own. Our wounds are public, and I believe our healing needs to be, too. I think we need one another in this time. We need to continue lobbying, to showing up at town halls, to calling our senators, our legislators, to even posting on Facebook. But I think we also need to hear the call from our own hearts to turn again towards love by sharing in community with one another so that we may seek a justice that is actually full of justice. The people who attended the meal last month are interested in organizing in our church to host more of these opportunities. Sally Buckholt, will you stand up and say hi? hi. Sally, yet again, has a clipboard for you this morning. <laughs> she will be out in the gathering area if you're interested in getting connected to this kind of space. I need revolutionary, life in, revolutionary love in my life. Do you? Yeah. Our faith calls us towards it. It invites us to accept the invitation. When our children call us to do what we don't want to do, we do it most of the time in a good enough way, in a good enough time frame of work of time, right? We're not perfect, and yet the love makes a way in us anyway. Let us lean on this love. Let it guide us towards love of ourselves love of others, and love of those with whom we disagree. Let us choose to find ways to be people of revolutionary love, and let's start at the beginning. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us sing as a prayerful way of closing this message. <laughs> 